Welcome. I am so glad that you are joining us here on our online worship service, Woodlawn Without Walls. I'm Pastor Lance Carithers, and uh, I'm so glad that you're with us. This service is designed for those who are unable to join us in person for worship, as well as for those who may be looking for a church home and, and joining us as a way of sort of checking out what Woodlawn United Methodist Church might be all about. Uh, we welcome you as well. You can always find announcements about upcoming events and our ministries on our website, so I'd invite you to turn to our website, woodlawnumc.net. You'll find out about things that are coming up like um, our youth lock-in next week and, and as we start Lent together, the Pancake Supper and the Ash Wednesday service that'll be happening on February 22nd. There's that and so much much more, just go to our website, click on the news link, and you'll find out more information. Uh, our website is also uh, available for those who might want to give a gift to our ministry. You can click the giving link and just follow the instructions that are there on that page. Will you join me in our call to worship as we center ourselves and prepare for worship together today? God of life, in your hand we find our lives. Be present with us in this time together. Let your spirit mold us, shape us, and remake us today and every day until we conform to the shape that you call us to take, the shape of love known and shown in Jesus the Christ. <laughs>
Praying together is an important part of being a, a part of the community of Christ. I invite you now to join me in uh, our praying together. Um, if you have a prayer request, uh, a couple of ways that you can share it with us. Uh, you can either call our church office and, and share your prayer requests. It can be shared with pastors and, and even on our prayer chain if you wish. Uh, or you can also uh, hear wherever you're watching this service in the comments, you can comment that you have a prayer request. Um, let's join together and come before the mercy of God. Oh God, uh, send your spirit upon us. Light our path that we may travel the road that you have prepared for us. You desire from us hearts that are a fit place for you to live and dwell. And help us then to clear out long-held anger or resentments, prejudice, and hate. Help us to furnish our hearts with love and mercy and justice, forgiveness, compassion, that they might be a place where you feel welcome and at home. Oh God, today we, we pray for the sick, those who are recovering by your mercy and healing, we also pray for those whose illnesses are chronic and ongoing and those whose illnesses are life-threatening. While we desire for healing to take place here in our presence, we are grateful that ultimately healing is always finally available in your presence. So God, for those who have entered into the eternal home that you have prepared for them, we give thanks. But help us as we grieve their passing and feel the, the hurt and the loss and the pain of living without them. We pray God today for, for any and all for whom life is hard, made difficult by, by circumstances or choices, just the trials of life. Help us um, to reach out, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be helpful for our brothers and sisters on this journey of life with us. And as we, we hear your scriptures proclaimed today, God, reveal your word to us. Enable our hearts and our minds to more fully understand your goodness and your grace, that we may be better suited to share it with others. Help us break free from ideas that no longer bring life, that we may embrace the life-giving work of your Spirit and truly follow the way of kingdom living. All this we pray as we pray the prayer that your Son Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're spending the last few weeks here before Lent in the book of Matthew with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Last week, I mentioned that two of the very first things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount is telling his disciples, you are salt, you are light. Two indispensable elements, a very small bit of each, makes a great impact on whatever it is in. Well, this week, Jesus moves on to begin talking more about who he hopes his followers will become, moving beyond the letter of the law, embracing instead the intent and purpose of what it means to live as God desires. Jesus does this through a series of statements. 
Each statement begins with the phrase, you have heard it said, and then continues with, but I say to you. And in this way, Jesus himself becomes the authority for how one is to live a godly life. I'm going to read again from Matthew 5 this week. I am reading today, beginning at verse 21. You have heard it said of those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So, when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said of those in ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. A theme is emerging in the early part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's a theme of influence. How do we as Christians influence? How do our, how do our lives have an impact on those around us. Remember, that was the essence last week when we talked about Jesus saying to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You have an impact. You have influence. Well, now, as Jesus continues his sermon, he remains focused on the influence that he wants his disciples to have, not just individually, but as a community of faithful, godly people. Implied in such a community are relationships. The members of a community have relationship with one another, and that the community has a relationship with the world around it. You might have noticed in our reading today how Jesus is raising the standard of behavior for his followers. He wants his followers to go further, to go deeper. He's asking them, in essence, asking us to not simply follow the rules, but to consider how our behaviors and our choices and our attitudes impact the wider community around us. And this is why 
Right off, Jesus addresses some of the most sacred rules for the Jewish people, the rules that are found in the Ten Commandments, the core of the Law of Moses. I think he does this because in a rule-based society, people sometimes begin to think about what is the, what is the minimum effort that I have to put forward in order to abide by the rules. It's like asking, what's the passing grade for the exam? A desire to do just enough to pass, to skate by. I think Jesus didn't want followers who were looking for the least they could do in order to be accepted, but, but wanted followers who were willing to excel and set an example. Followers that would not only pass, but blow up the curve, right? Blow up the curve in such a way that others would strive to do better that his followers would have an impact on the world around them. Remember, Jesus' followers are salt and light for the world. Hmm? There's a book um, that was published not long ago. It's titled, What is the least that I can believe and still be a Christian? <laughs> it was written by a pastor named Martin Thielen. He meant it to be helpful for those who want to know what is the essence, the essence of the Christian faith. But, you know, with a title like, what is the least I can believe and still be a Christian, there's a tendency to say, I, I, I want to know what the boundary is so that I can just believe enough. I can just do enough to get by. Jesus says instead, you thought you knew the rules, the minimum expectations? Well, there's more. You have heard it said, but I say to you, hmm? You read through these verses and tell me if you're not taken aback just a little. They seem so extreme. I mean, forget murder. Jesus says you can't even be angry or throw an insult or call somebody a fairly innocuous name like you fool. And forget adultery. I mean, just looking at someone other than your spouse with desire, well, that's enough. It's considered a sin punishable. And if it's your eye or your hand that is implicated in your sin, cut them off. Cut them out of your life. Really, that's, that's what Jesus says. He even talks about divorce. There's only one legitimate basis for divorce in Jesus's mind. Otherwise, it's the adultery thing all over again. And let alone worrying about giving false witness, just stay away from swearing any oath at all because you're not in control. So you can't swear by God or by earth or by Jerusalem, even your own head. You're not in control. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no, with integrity rather than trying to make your word uh, into something that it just cannot be. Rules are one thing, but as I said, these are intense, extreme rules. I mean, equating murder and adultery, entering false testimony with anger and insults, lust, divorce, trying to convince someone else that what we're talking about is absolutely true. <laughs> I wonder if what Jesus is doing here is trying to raise the standard so as to amplify the fact that living a life that is pleasing to God might involve more than we were bargaining for. 
it might not even be just about how we keep in good stead with God, but more about how we keep in good stead with others around us how the community makes an impact in the world. Perhaps Jesus is trying to get those who want to follow him, and that would include us, to realize something about ourselves and about our relationships with other people. You see, Jesus really is addressing things that matter when people live together in community. He recognizes that there's there's no relationship with God that isn't directly affected by one's relationship with others. They're interconnected. Jesus appears to be saying that we ought not to take anyone for granted. We ought not run the risk of hurting anyone. We ought not to treat anyone less than as a child of God. And these aren't rules so much as a way of creating a community that begins to resemble the kingdom of God. After all, what is a kingdom? <laughs> Here on Super Bowl Sunday in this neck of the woods, that's sort of a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> a kingdom. Where do we hear that term? Nowadays, we recognize the chief's kingdom by the people and their allegiance to the Kansas City Chiefs and their zeal in following their team through the course of the season. Listen to these words from a Chiefs fan site that tries to explain the kingdom. Plenty of new faces have joined the bandwagon, but the newbies on the squad don't fully understand what it truly means to be a part of the Chiefs' kingdom. It hasn't always been glorious comebacks and amazing quarterback play. To be a true part of the kingdom, you have to promise to stick by this squad through thick and thin. And in the past, it seemed like there was a lot more thin to go around than thick. Chief's kingdom, the website says, is truly that. It's a kingdom. It knows no boundaries, no arbitrary borders that seem to rule the rest of the free world. The Kansas City Star wrote an article sharing stories from international Chief's fans, showing just how far the Chief's kingdom actually stretches. It's truly multinational. From a fan in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, who got his start watching the Chiefs when the 49ers traded his favorite player, Joe Montana, to the Chiefs in the early 90s, all the way to one from Kawanishi, Japan, who became a Chiefs fan during the spring of 2017. The Chiefs' kingdom knows no borders, no age restrictions. And this, at its core, is what makes the kingdom great, the fan site says. There are no restrictions on who can join. All you need is a love of the Chiefs, a love of the game, and a love of barbecue. Come one, come all, because the Chiefs' kingdom is welcoming all comers. <laughs> you see, it's... It's not enough just to be a football fan or even a Chiefs fan. That's something you can do individually. But you might desire to be a part of a kingdom, to sense the common bond, to be a part of the unitedness that is forged through devotion to a team. It's about relationship, one's relationship to the franchise and the game, but also one's relationship to others in the kingdom and the kingdom's relationship to the world, welcoming all comers to join them. In many ways, the kingdom of God is very similar. Now, individually, one can be a believer, one can be devoted to God, but wouldn't it be better to be a part of a kingdom Hmm. Part of, of the united purpose, joining together with others, to be a part of something bigger, where our relationship with God involves our relationship with and to 
others and our relationship to those who are not a part of the kingdom, that they might see who we are and what we're a part of and want to be part of it too, that we might be ready to welcome all comers. The text this week is a call to be forgiving and to work toward reconciliation in every relationship. Because relationships within the body are important, but so is the relationship of the body to the world. Jesus calls us to go above and beyond in our attempt to see all people as worthy of God's love. It isn't easy, and it will require more from us, more than just the bare minimum. But a higher expectation of how we will treat others, how we will put their needs before our own, even if it means pruning what is harmful or hurtful out of our lives, is to live our lives as an act of love. It is to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. May God give us grace as we try and give us strength in our efforts to do just that. Thanks be to God. Receive this blessing. May God be with us as we seek to live as a people of God's kingdom. And may our actions and our words reflect our desire to be a part of the transformation of the world in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.